The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for, for Autism. Already I'm, I'm off, off on the wrong foot here. <laughs> the Center for Autism and Related Disorders here in Tarzana, California. I say it so much and I live it so much that it just didn't want to trip off of my tongue this morning. It's Monday and we're going to be with you live for the next two hours talking about autism and hopefully getting you set up so that you can be making the most progress that's possibly available for you or for a child that you're working with on the autism spectrum. We welcome all of you, whether you're a parent, teacher, practitioner, individual who's on the spectrum or D all of the above, because you really could be D all of the above, right? Uh, really excited to be here today and want to remind all of you that we really want to be talking about autism from a 360 degree perspective, no matter where you are, how this affects you. And we're pretty sure that this affects everyone at this point. If you don't, if you aren't aware of the fact that you know somebody who's on the autism spectrum, you will be soon because, uh, unfortunately the numbers are such and growing at such a degree that that's a reality. Now, are there good things? things uh, once you get on this journey, when, once autism becomes a part of your life, yes, I can attest to that. And we want to help you to get to the good things and overcome the disabling aspects of what this, because this, if, if not treated, um, this is something that can rip apart families and, and really have a devastating effect on lives. We can get through that uh, given the right help and support, and there is help and support available. I want you to know that. And we try to hook you up with the answers for where you are uh, in space and in time and ability to get access to those things. Because we know that for the mom in Kansas, it's vastly different than the mom who's in Idaho. And for the dad who's in Maine or, you know, the aunt who's in Australia, every place has different services. I wish I could tell you that, this, that the, le the, the field is being leveled and that everybody's starting to get the same thing. We're not there yet. Uh, we are also a work in progress as a community of people uh, dealing with and embracing and coping with autism. So I want to be here as a resource for you. You know, this morning I was writing something because somebody had asked me to, uh, to speak about what it's like being an autism parent, because that's what I am. I always remind you, I'm not an expert in autism, and I'm an autism parent, and uh, what it is to be an autism parent. And I was so reminded, we, we didn't do a show on Friday, we uh, went and filmed a couple of things, and I was so reminded over the weekend about how uh, I have yet to meet the autism parent that I don't like, and like a lot. Man, met some great parents over the weekend. Uh, but this journey is tough, you can't do it by yourself, you gotta have some help and support. And I, I always tell the story about the fact that at some point, you know, Nancy Allspot Jackson talks about the kitchen floor club. At some point, a lot of us get down on the kitchen floor and say, okay, I need some help here for, you know, to the God of our understanding or whoever it is that we're talking to and say, I need some help here. And if I can get some help for my child, then I promise I will turn around and I will help some other people. So you got to know that's where I'm at. My, my child got a whole lot of help. He's still getting help. Uh, and this is something, you know, know, I think that uh, there's always going to be a little bit of autism in our lives, and uh, but less and less of the disabling aspects of the disorder are are in our lives. And I, it's high time, and it has been for a while now that I turn around and try to help some other people. So please know that's why I'm here. Everything that we do here is a free resource. So ask your questions. I'll try to hook you up with answers. I don't have the answers, but I, a lot of times I know who to ask, or I know somebody who knows somebody who knows 
knows who to ask. So, you know, it's all about that, right? Let's all be connected. Let's hold hands together on this journey. So I uh, also want to remind you that, the, as I said, this show, we're here as a resource. We want you to interact with us. The whole show is meant to be interactive. So Emily is going to show you some of the different ways that you can interact with us here, some of the different ways that you can watch the show and some of the different ways you can tell us a suggestion, a comment, a question. Uh, we love to hear from you guys. And I'm going to remind you that there's only one ways to one way to watch us live right now, although we're, we're asking for your help because we want another way for you to watch us live that's very exciting. It's within our grasp. Uh, but right now, there's only one way. That's at www.autism-live.com. When you go to autism-live.com, you'll see uh, a box that looks like a computer. And if you are watching other than on a tablet, you the show should be playing there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We interrupt the show five days a week, Monday through Friday, for two hours to be here with you live. If you have the opportunity to watch us live, that's from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here in the United States. It is 10 a.m. to noon on our time zone, which is Pacific time zone. Do the math wherever you are, daylight settings time or not in the world to figure out when we're live for you. Uh, but know that you can watch us the rest of the time. And there is a white box that's next to the computer where you can type in your questions 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, they show up. Uh, over the weekend, you guys wrote in some things, and I want you guys, uh, as much as possible, remember that I won't know what you were watching when you wrote it. So reference it for me, because uh, some of the things that you guys have written in, somebody wrote funding. Now, I'm assuming that that means you want to know, how do I get funding? But you should never let me assume anything. <laughs> Give me as much information, because heaven knows I can get off on a wrong track. And I want to be of use to you. Please know that. So write in your questions, comments, suggestions. If we're here with an expert live and you want to ask them something in real time, you know, write in. I try to do, uh, I try to watch. Sometimes I miss it. It's important to ask at the beginning of the interview because sometimes you guys will write things in and I see it as they just left. Uh, but we try to forward that to them as well. In any case, write in, participate, be a part of this. Let us know what's working for you. Let us know what's not working for you. Tell me if there's something about the show that's driving you buggy. Don't, don't make me guess. Uh, I always say I gave up mind reading to be an autism mom and a proud autism mom. I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about why I'm so particularly proud this week in a little while, but we always like to start the morning off with something that we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. Now, this is when we take one word, one phrase, one acronym, and we try to make sense of it, put it in perspective for you with your everyday life. This, one of the things that we're going to be talking about today is, you know, how you streamline your life so that you can get the most out of what's going on. You can make the most progress and keep your stomach lining. Uh, it's, trust me, it will be important to you later on. Uh, so one of the things that we, we really want you to do is in some small way, make friends with the jargon. It's so intensive. I know you know this. I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but, uh, if you try to solve it one little bit at a time, I I'm telling you, it makes a difference. Okay. So that's what we do. We're going to give you the actual definition than the working definition, which is a little less exact, but maybe makes a little bit more sense. We hope so. Okay. Today we're, we're taking a term that really can kick your keister because I don't think it it, it doesn't sound like what it is to me at all. Maybe you can enlighten me as to why it's called this, but it's called mass trial. Now, to me, this sounds like there's a whole bunch of people who've been accused of something and there's a judge and a jury and we're going to figure out, you know, whether they all did it or not. Uh, what does this have to do with autism? Okay, this is an ABA term. We talk about ABA a lot on the show, applied behavior analysis. There's a reason why we talk about it, and that's because it has been shown scientifically to be effective with all of our children on the autism spectrum. As a teaching tool, we can make great progress in teaching a child new things and diminishing challenging behavior using the principles 
principles of ABA. It is by no means the only thing we talk about here, but because it is for most of us, a foreign concept, and we know that it is something that is very useful at creating progress, whether your child is 14 and high functioning, or they are three years old and completely nonverbal, these principles are going to help you to teach. And by the way, ABA wasn't created for autism. It's helpful in creating progress for those of us who are not on the spectrum and diminishing behaviors that we'd like to decrease and increasing knowledge and skills in other areas. ABA works. So that's one of the reasons why we talk about it. Uh, and of course, it's expensive. Uh, if you're saying, yeah, well, Shannon, ABA sounds great, but I don't know how in the hey, nani, nani, we're going to afford that. Don't worry. We're going to talk about that in a little while, too. Okay. So mass trial. What is it? If it's not a bunch of people before a jury, what is it? Our actual definition, mass trial, it's repeated consecutive trials of the same SD and target. Now, this is why the jargon makes me furious as an autism parent, because I remember looking this up when I would hear this once my son started ABA and I, we would go to his clinic every two weeks and they would be talking about, well, let's mass trial this and let's mass trial this and let's mass trial that. And I remember not wanting to interrupt the meeting to say, okay, what exactly is a mass trial? I thought I'll just try to get it in context. I wasn't getting it. And so I looked it up and, oh, repeated and consecutive trials, I understand these words, of the same SD. Okay, so then you look up SD and then you find yourself going down the rabbit hole of, you know, it's four hours later and you've accomplished very little and you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, this is why we do this. Okay, so uh, let's go to our working definition to see if that can help us to get a little bit clearer. Uh, mass trial, getting your child to demonstrate exactly the same target behavior and you're doing it over and over and over again. So uh, we've all done this. We have all mass trialed something at some point in our lives with someone doing something, even if we did it with ourselves. Uh, you know, let's say that you are, you, you got a new workout video and you're going to learn how to do this dance routine for this workout video, right? right? And everything is moving really quickly and they got the unka, unka, unka music going on and you're trying to follow along with all the things and you're eight steps behind, right? But then you go to the end of the video and they have the instructional part of the video where they're going to break it down into little segments so that you can learn how to do that one crossover step while it's going unka, unka, unka. And what do you do? They show you the crossover step, right? And then you try to do the crossover step and you do it and you don't go, woohoo, I got it. Now I'm going to go back to the video because chances are you're going to get in the middle of the unka, 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 and you still don't know the crossover step, right? So what do you do? You don't work on the whole step together. You just work on that crossover step and you do it, right? And you pause for a second, then you do it again. And then you do it again and you do it again and you do it again and then you add the music to it and you do it again and you might have to back up and take the music out and go through it slowly one more time, right? But you just work on that step until you get it, right? Haven't we all done this with some aspect? Of that's mass trialing, right? Who knew? Who knew that that's what it was called? That's what it was called. But you're taking it outside and you're doing just a trial of that. Oh, did I get it? No, I didn't get it yet. You don't beat yourself up, but you go, okay, take another breath. Everybody who's doing this, everybody who's doing Dancing on the Stars does this, right? And you do this with literally everything that you've ever learned how to do at some point. You said, I'm not getting it right? Within a whole stream of, of behavior. And you take one little behavior, and you go, oh, why can't I get this? Oh, and you break it down a little bit and you just practice that. Let me see if I can do it again. Think about when you're teaching something to a child. You know, we try to teach the ABCs to a child, you know, singing the whole song together. But at some point, kids just like, how about the you know, even kids who are just really quick at picking things up, they still get into a dicey area, usually around LMNOP, right? Uh, and then you have to slow that down and work on just that part where you're singing in the car going LMNOP, right? Um, and then you say, let's try it again. You're mass trialing. You're just going to do that part over and over and over again until you got it. And then you're going to put it back into the hole. So mass trial is just the SD is the thing that you say or do to get the target behavior. So if my target is that I want to learn how to do the stand step, then 
you know, I, they're going to, I'm probably somebody's going to say, let's do it again. And then I'm going to do, that's my SD, that let's do it again. And I do my little dance step over and over and over again. Um, if it's learning how to brush your teeth, we're, if we just take it three times a day, chances are it's going to take us a long time, especially with a child on the autism spectrum. We know that giving them more opportunities to do something, we're going to be more likely to get to the point where it's successful and they have the behavior successfully. So we're not just going to brush our teeth three times a day. We might go in and say, let's brush our teeth. We might break it down into even a smaller thing. Our SD might be put the toothpaste on the toothbrush right? Or it might be unscrew the cat, whatever it is that we're working on. Uh, we're going to do it again and again and again, giving the person an opportunity to get it. We've all mass trialed. It feels very foreign sometimes, especially when we're doing it with a child. I don't know. Maybe it feels, I, I'm second guessing that. Maybe it feels just as uh, awkward sometimes when we're doing it with an adult. I, I can remember a couple of years ago, um, stopping outside of a store because my son, like there was something that just wasn't going right. And we'd done so much mass trial with him. Um, and so we were crossing the street and I don't remember exactly what happened. Uh, sometimes he walks funny and he drags his feet and just, you know, and I said, Oh, you know what? Let's try that again. Let's try that again and, and see if we can cross the street. We're going to look both ways and we're going to walk, you know, with our feet normal and let's try it again. And he was like, what? And I said, yeah, let's just do it again. Let's practice. And so we walked across again and we got to the other side of the, the you know, the into the parking lot. And I said, you know, let's do it again. And he said, what are we doing? And I said, let's, and of course I try to make it fun. I said, let's have some fun. Let's see how many times we can, we can get this right. And each time I sort of added a little bit to it, which isn't technically, you know, but added to it in a fun way. Uh, but so we kept crossing the street and I didn't really have to talk to him about that for quite a while afterwards. So mass trialing, doing the same thing again and again and again. If you're teaching colors, you're just teaching red and you're mass trialing red, you know, saying, give me red. And the child gives you, yay, fabulous. Good job. Boom, boom, boom. Give me red. I'm only working on red. Later on, we'll talk about when you're mixing it up with other things and what that's called. But for today, mass trial, working on the same thing, working on the same thing, same target, and just doing consecutive trials of it. Okay, moving on. We always have a question of the day for you. Uh, we have certainly had a lot of questions about inclusion, and we've got a week coming up where we're just going to focus on inclusion. But today, we want to know from you, what do you think of inclusion? It's really been eye-opening to me as you guys have asked questions because uh, I didn't know starting out if my child was going to be eligible for inclusion. Um, but he was, by the time he was in preschool, he was eligible for inclusion and full inclusion so that he spent his entire time. My, my child never has had to go to special day. Now, do I attribute that to, you know, that he's just so, uh, high functioning? No, we got intensive services really early on and focused on that. And I know that that's why he was able to be included. And there was also, you know, I mean, there was a lot of hard work and I will say to you and some luck, uh, cause I know there are a lot of you out there who have worked your fingers to the bone and your child has worked themselves, uh, tired and they're still not ready for inclusion. And here's what I've learned in the last year is that it really is child specific and it's school specific and it's location specific that you can have a child who could go to one school and because of the way the school runs inclusion, they would be ready for it. And you can have another school where inclusion is really a bad idea because their idea of inclusion and what inclusion in my opinion should be. Mm. Uh, so really interested to know what you guys think. Cause I really am learning that, it, uh, that it really is child specific school specific school specific and location specific, but I'd love to hear from you. We're going to drop in on Facebook a little while later to see your thoughts on inclusion. Let us know, is your child included 
are you happy with your child's placement and what you think of inclusion where you are it's an emotional issue i'm i'm really learning i uh i know i was very emotional when i realized that my child was being invited to be included we had been told the year before that that wasn't going to be a possibility um so i was over the moon and it meant something really important to me that he was going to be included. My son is about to start fifth grade, fully included. And um, it is, as he grows older, it's a very interesting thing. It, it constantly morphs and changes in my mind uh, about, and I don't rule out the possibility that for junior high or high school that we may send him someplace different. Um, because I've shared before on the show that as we did this last IEP, the thing that really was overwhelming to me was realizing that all of the, the goals and things that we're working on with him uh, sort of take a backseat to, I know how my son is going to react at school. I know what he's capable of. The difficult part is the social part in terms of how the other kids are going to react and how the other kids are going to treat him and what that does to him while he's learning. Uh, oof, took my breath away when I came to that realization. So uh, my idea of inclusion, it continues to grow and morph and change. I'm hopeful that I'm going to be able to find a place for him in two years in junior high where he's going to go to school with kids who are going to be respectful and kind and understand that different isn't a bad thing. Um, I haven't found that where we live yet. I'm still looking, jury's still out, and I got two years, but it's weighing on me. Weighing on me huge. So what's weighing on you? Talk to us. Let's talk about inclusion. Okay, we always have a topic of the week, and our topic this week, I'm really excited about this, uh, it's, we're, we're saying making it work because we all have different circumstances. We all have different things going on, um, both having to do with autism and just life circumstances. What's going on and how do you overcome the obstacles? How do you make it work? And um, this was something that I don't know that I languaged it this way, but early on I started looking at other people because it seemed so overwhelming to me. When my child was diagnosed with autism, I I just thought I don't I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if we can do this. I don't know if he can do this. And I don't know <laughs> you know the phrase. I mean it sounds very melodramatic, but I used to say to my husband over and over and over again, I would say, you know, uh, what what's going to become of us? What is going to become of us? And I looked to other people because I'm a firm believer in not having to reinvent the wheel. If you don't have to, why would you? So look at other people and going, all right, how are they making that work? How are they keeping the lights on and making that work? I want to know what's your secret, right? So we're going to talk about that this week. How do you make it work? How do you make it work emotionally? How do you make it work financially? How do you make it work just in terms of the schedule? How do you stay focused with your partner? I mean, you know, I don't have answers, but I've got a lot of suggestions and I know you guys too. So we're going to be asking you this week to tell us, how are you making at work because I'm sure that we all have some aspects of our lives. There are some things that I can look to and I go, I can go, we did really good at this. Oh, we massively blew it here. <laughs> right. And, and so if, if we can piece together, okay, this is the part that we figured out. Uh, here's where I still have questions and maybe you have that puzzle piece figured out, but you don't have one of the other puzzles. So let's trade and share, uh, and see if we can't all figure out how to make it work. Because we don't really have a choice. That's the bottom line. Uh, I mean, I guess we do. We can just be miserable. But really, who wants to do that? I want to make it work. I want to I wanna make it count. I want to make it work and make it count. So some of the different things that we're going to be talking about today, we have a stress tip. It's Monday. It's time to talk about stress. And today, we're going to be specifically talking about guilt. <sighs> You know, uh, they talk about the green eyed monster. I don't know what the monster is, the guilt, but it's, it's bad. It's bad. And it's very prevalent with autism families. I 
myself participate in it. So let's, let's see if we can't get a grip, all of us on the guilt monster. And then we're going to go back to basics. We're doing autism 101 today because we're making it work. How, how do we combat all those different things I was talking about? How are we going to make the money work? How are we going to work to make the schedule work? How are you going to make it work for your other kids, uh, that aren't on the spectrum? How are you going to stay connected to your significant other? So Temple Grandin had some great advice on that, uh, that I'm working on. I'm really working on it. And then we're going to talk a little bit about starting ABA, why it's so important. I saw some things on Facebook over the weekend that just really hurt my heart a little bit about parents who are saying no to ABA and they've got their reasons and I don't, there's no judgment. Please know that there is no judgment. I, it is just my overwhelming fear that they're going to kick themselves later on. And so we're going to talk about that and talk about what might be stopping you from starting an ABA uh, program and how we can make it work. All of that and ever so much more, including your comments and questions. And I am going to go through some of the different questions that you guys have written in uh, over the weekend. So stick with us and participate. We really enjoy it when you do. We'll be back after these messages. Hi guys, welcome back. For the month of July, I figured we're going to do something again that's more for outdoorsiness since it's summertime and I know your kids are going to be home and you need some activities to do inside and outside. So for July, I figured we'd make a lantern. So let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are wax paper, an iron, crayon, scissors, popsicle sticks, pencil sharpener, a glue gun, and tape. What I did first is that I have my iron heating on medium heat, okay? Make sure you keep this far away from your child because I won't want them to get hurt. Next thing I want to do is I'm going to take my wax paper and I'm going to make four sheets. I'm going to cut out a thing that's about 12 inches long, okay? Now that I have my wax papers cut out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my crayon and if you have kids around, which I hope you do, I'm going to grab them and have them make some crayon shavings. What the shavings you're going to end up doing is making it a design. And again, this is another time for you and your child to talk about colors. You can discuss like what would happen if you mix, you know, some blue crayons and some yellow crayons. What would that produce? When you and your child have finally decided there's enough crayon shavings on your wax paper, what you're going to do next is you're going to take it and fold it in half. Now that I have it folded in half, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an old newspaper and then I'm going to sandwich it in between. And then with my iron on medium heat, I'm just going to have it gently on there just so the wax melts into the paper and becomes one thing. Let's take a peek inside. And as you can see, all the crayons have you know, melted into it, making this beautiful kind of like rainbow-ish color. All right, now I'm gonna do this with the other three that I've made, and then we're gonna assemble our beautiful lantern, all right? So here are my four finished panels that I'm now I'm ready to build into the lantern. So what I'm gonna do is I have these popsicle sticks, and I'm gonna build them into a square and glue them together with my hot glue gun. While you're building your lantern, it's a good opportunity to work on math skills with your child. You could discuss how many sides does a square have versus how many sides does a cube have. Okay, I'm gonna do this another three more times so I have one for every single side. All right, well, now that I have these four different sides built, I am now gonna take these wax paper things that I built and then I'm gonna put glue on here and smash it on there, okay? I know the wax paper is way too big for it, but what we're gonna do later is trim it. All right, so now they're all done being glued together. Now I'm gonna take my scissors and trim along the outside. Now that the four sides are done, I'm gonna take some tape and I'm gonna line the edge of it so they will stay together to make my cube form. And voila, here's my lantern, but it's missing something. You're right, it's missing a light to illuminate it. So what I'm gonna put in here is an LED light. I'm definitely not gonna put a real candle or else the thing's gonna catch on fire and that is a real safety hazard, okay? So, here's my little guy and I'm gonna turn it on and so let's see what happens. Ooh, look at that, isn't that pretty nice? And it's not even dark yet. I would love if you shared your pictures of your finished crafts, but until then, craft on. Bye guys. Can you see me flying by your side? Welcome back to Autism Live. You know, every Monday we like to give you a stress tip. This is when we 
the fact that this is stress is very much a part of this journey whether you yourself are on the spectrum or you're the parent of a child who's on the spectrum or you're a teacher practitioner working with a child who's on the spectrum we know uh, especially for parents that studies have shown very clearly that the expectation is that we will have more stress and by the way this is not contingent upon how well your child is doing that even after a child begins to progress and is making all kinds of headway, parents are still reporting that the stress level is high. Um, and it doesn't seem to necessarily follow lines around, well, the, the, the parents who have children who are more profoundly affected uh, or the children that are high functioning, you know, who has more stress, it's across the board. So the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to understand and be understanding that there's just more stress. Now, I would, I would say to all of us, we will know that for each other and we will accept that for each other. It is almost impossible to convince somebody who does not have a child on the autism spectrum that a child, that a parent of a child on the autism spectrum has more stress. It is a lot like explaining uh, a, a, the color chartreuse to someone who has never ever been able to see color either through color blindness or because they are in, in fact entirely blind. It's a really hard concept for people to understand. I used to get so insulted and offended when I would say to parents, you know, I'm, we're just having a lot of stress and going through a difficult time because, you know, our child is on the spectrum and they would go, oh, but it's like that for all parents. No. No, it's not. We have science to show it, but don't argue it because you won't convince them. They don't know what you're talking about. They can't possibly know and bless them that they don't know. But save your breath. Come to another autism parent and we will shake our heads and go, yes, it is. So we're going to accept those two things out the gate. We're going to have more stress and Joe average parent isn't going to get it. All right. We can let those things be moving into acceptance on those things. But once we accept that we're going to have more stress, we need to manage it. We talk about this every week and we give you a different tip. And today I want to talk specifically about the guilt germ. It's a big one, right? And here's another thing to accept that no matter how much you do, no matter how much you do, it's never going to feel like enough because you can never do everything. Okay. Big, deep breath, right? Oh, cause isn't that devastating? Even, you know, I say that now and I'm being honest with you that I feel this as an autism parent that, uh, you know, somebody can come up to me and say, Oh my gosh, you've done so much with and for your child. And it's so amazing. It's never going to be enough. <sighs> It just isn't. And I look at, you know, Nancy Allspot Jackson, who comes in and she says that they just gave away $50,000 for ACT Today, which I think is amazing. That that's $50,000 worth of help to families that I know it's going to change the game for them, right? But the next thing that I hear out of Nancy's mouth is, it's just not enough. It's never going, and I say to her, we all get it. It's never going to be enough. It is never, ever going to be enough. So do we just focus on that and go, oh, it's never enough. It's not. Because I'll tell you what, in those five minutes, you know, and every once in a while you have to just acknowledge it and go, yep, yep, that's right. But in that five minutes that you go, oh, no, I'm not doing enough. That's time you could have been doing something. So we really have to get on track and find a way to talk to that thing in our head, that green, horrible, fanged monster that wants to say we're not getting it done. And I think every parent has a different thing that they say, some sort of monster uh, phrase that they say to that guy, like, look, I'm doing everything that I can, or today I'm just going to do what's possible, or I'm going to do what's in front of me to, uh, today. Some people say sufficient onto the day, there are, but figure out the phrase for you so that when that thing pops up and says, ah, you're not getting it done, that you have a response to quiet it. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm advocating talking to yourself. <laughs> it's okay. Talk to yourself. But to have some sort of an answer to that ick, uh, to say, you know what? I'm doing the best that I can and walk tall. I have a really good friend who years before I had a child on the spectrum, I used to be one of those parents that she would talk about how stressful it was. And I would think, well, you know, but parenting is stressful. Yeah. 
because I didn't get it. I was one of those people. How could I possibly have gotten it? Right. And I remember once my child was diagnosed with autism, talking with her because her son is significantly older and, and talking about, you know, how do you deal with when people look at him differently or do whatever? And she said, Oh, I put my shoulders back and I walk with pride because nobody knows what I've been through and what he's been through. I'm not going to waste my time telling them. I walk with pride. Uh, we didn't do it all and we didn't do it all right. And we didn't do it perfect, but I know what we did and I walk with pride. And I always think of her and I think of, Oh, put those shoulders back and walk with the pride of knowing that you're, you, you have a higher calling. You've, you've been asked to step up to something that everybody doesn't get to call, get called to. And I don't know why you got called. I don't know why I got called, but we're showing up. And sometimes that's the level best you can do on a day. And I love when Evelyn Gould comes in and talks about making room, you know, because stuff's happening today and you got to make room for everything that's happening. I just had this pep talk because I'm here talking to you about summer and getting things done. But the guilt monster is saying, oh, I'm not doing enough this summer. We didn't do enough things, but, 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 you know, you do what you can. You do what's right for you right now, taking into consideration all the things that you have going on and, and you say whatever the phrase is to that, to that thing. Uh, you know, you say, I'm, I'm showing up today, whatever it is. And you put your shoulders back and you walk with pride because you're an autism parent. And that is something you should be really proud of. And, and there are many of us who know to some degree what it is that you're doing and what you're walking through. And we know it's not easy. We can't know it all because you've got your own set of circumstances, but we know some of what you're going through and we are proud of you, right? So we all put our shoulders back, walk with pride, face the guilt monster. Don't let it continue yakking at you. Talk to it. Say, no, I'm sorry. I'm not participating with you. You go sit over there. I have things to do and, and not, and they're not having prolonged conversations with you. You do what you can and it has to be enough for today. And then tomorrow you'll see the cards you got dealt with and you'll do what you can tomorrow. But today we're going to focus on today. So that's my stress tip for the week. I'm trying to be mindful of that myself and tell that guilt person, go sit over there. We're not talking to you. You have a timeout. That's the one place where we can use timeout. Give guilt a timeout. No, go sit over there. Uh, I've got things to do. All right, we are going to take a break. And when we come back, I'm going to start to take on some of the things that you guys wrote in about. And one of them specifically about what is the gluten-free diet and what does it have to do with autism? Stick with us. The Institute for Behavioral Training provides courses in applied behavior analysis for the treatment of autism. Access IBTE learning videos on the move and learn at your own pace. I'm going to talk a little bit about intensity. IBTE learning makes any location your classroom on the go. So our objectives for today are to really learn what is autism and how is it diagnosed. Get professional guidance with IBT face-to-face -face training. IBT face-to-face -face training courses prepare you to effectively implement ABA-based interventions. Choose between small group and one-to-one -one instruction. Earn BCBA supervision hours via one-to-one -one video conferencing. So I had a chance to review your BIP today. You know what? It looked really good. You did a good job with that. IBT continuing education courses. Earn credit through webinars, conferences, article reviews, and e-learning videos. You can learn more at ibehavioraltraining.com. IBT, 360 degrees of ABA training. Welcome back. I just have to give a shout out. That's the first time we've been able to play that commercial and so, so very thrilled. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of IBT. We're going to be going over today some of the different things that you can do on this journey. We're sort of taking it back and going to Autism 101. And one of the things that we're going to be talking about in a little while is getting yourself knowledgeable. And I think that IBT is one of the easiest ways to do that. It wasn't available when I was starting out. And it's exactly what I would have wanted. Um, you know, when, when my son was diagnosed with autism, they were saying, oh, well, you can go take this college class. 
And I remember thinking, on what planet? I'll, I'll just take my child who's tantruming, who's two and a half, and we'll go sit in a lecture. I used to teach college. I'll go sit in a lecture hall and let him lay on the floor and tantrum and kick and scream so that I can learn about what to do for him when he's tantruming. And how am I going to pay for that? And how long before the teacher says, you know, this isn't working for the rest of us? Um, I kept on saying, isn't there something that I can do when he finally goes to sleep at 2.30 in the morning? Uh, you know, isn't there some way? And, you know, yay, yes, there is IBT, and it's really affordable. Uh, the topics start, I think, as low as $7.50, and you own, once you download the video, you own it. So, you, you know, you've paid $7.50, and you look at it and you, for, you know, to learn about something, and you look at it and go, this was amazing. I want to share it with my husband, and I want to share it with my mother-in-law, and I want to share it with the babysitters, and I want to share it with my son's teacher. You know, it's yours to share. So I, I encourage you, go to ibehavioraltraining.com, pick the subjects you want. If you're you know, if you don't have to start with what is autism, if you already know that gig, you don't have to start on that video. Don't pay for that video if you already know what autism is. But if you don't, if you don't really know what the diagnosis is and how your kid gets diagnosed, uh, it's really worthwhile to know that. It will help you on your journey. Uh, and there are so many topics. And you get to pick from three different categories if you want to get stuff that's specifically for parents that it's less jargon intensive. You can pick that area if you want to pick the area that's for teachers because you're in the classroom and you need stuff that's mindful of. I don't have just one child. I've got 28 children. What am I doing under those circumstances when I can't just be one-to-one? -one? Or if you're somebody who wants to eventually be a practitioner or you are a practitioner right now, uh, they have at that level too. Of course, it's jargon intensive at that level. But you can work your way up to that. So I encourage you, go to ibehavioraltraining.com. It's really uh, amazing what it can do for you. And you can do it wherever you are if you have an internet connection. And uh, oof, good stuff, good stuff. Okay, I promised that we were going to come back and answer this question about uh, diet. So let's take a short break and we're going to come back and talk about one of the things that we want to do in terms of making it work, getting our kids healthy, which may involve a diet change, may not. Stick with us. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders is celebrating the grand opening of the CARD Assessment Center in Woodland Hills. The CARD Assessment Center provides consultation and assessment for individuals of all ages with a variety of disorders, including autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit disorder, memory disorder, learning disability, and intellectual giftedness. To schedule an appointment, contact the CARD Assessment Center today. Welcome back to Autism Live. All this week, we're talking about making it work. How do we make our lives work now that we have a diagnosis, either for ourselves or for our child? What are some things that we're going to change to make things make more sense? Making it work. And, you know, it changes over time, depending on where you are. But uh, we had a question that came in that I'm featuring right now on our site. What exactly is the gluten-free diet? What does it have to do with autism? Okay. Now, I am not a nutritionist, and I'm not a doctor. Uh, so I'm going to give you the parent perspective on this, but I'm also going to refer you to, we've had Julie Matthews from Nourishing Hope on the show twice now. Uh, you can watch those videos of her on our YouTube page. And I also encourage you to go to her website, nourishinghope.com. There are many different diets that people, um, espouse on the uh, autism journey. And one of them is the gluten-free, casein-free diet. Now, uh, I noticed that you wrote the gluten-free diet, and I know that was the way it was introduced to me to begin with. When my child was diagnosed with autism, I he was being evaluated by someone for services, and I said, okay, we're going through this process and we're waiting. Isn't there anything we can, do, can be doing in the meantime? Everything I keep reading says that there's this window in which we really need to get active and get our child help, that early intervention is key. And we're 
sitting around going like this while we're waiting for appointments and waiting for people to get their assessments done and to, uh, you know, it takes time. It takes a certain amount of time and you want it done right. But what do we do in the meantime? And that particular professional uh, said to me, oh, well, you know, there is that gluten free thing, uh, but I don't think it works. And uh, but some people swear by it. But doctors say that it doesn't work. So that was my introduction. I said, what are you talking about? It's like, what, what you talking about? Willis kind of thing. And she goes, oh, well, you know, you can Google it, but a lot of people do a gluten-free diet and some people think that it makes a difference with their kids. Okay. So, uh, and I, of course said, I don't, what is gluten? And she said, oh, it's in bread. And I went, oh, well, this is why I don't know what it is because I'm allergic to wheat. So for me personally, I went, oh, this is something I can do. I can take wheat out of my child's diet like that because I've been doing it for years for myself. And if it even has a glimmer of a hope of doing something different for my child, I'm all over it. I'm like white on rice. We're going to do this. And I did go home and I Googled gluten-free. And if you Google gluten-free, you'll get a bunch of celiac pages um, telling you how to remove gluten from the diet. What I didn't do was Google gluten-free and autism. Uh, I eventually did that about a week later and saw that there was another component to the diet, which was casein free. And I had no idea what casein was. Uh, but it's a, both gluten and casein are proteins. Gluten is a protein that's found in certain grains, in particular in wheat, but it's also in rye and barley. Um, and there are a couple of other ones as well. And most oats, while oats themselves don't have gluten in them, most oats are processed in plants that also process wheat. And so most commercial oats that don't say gluten-free are contaminated with gluten. And that's something you should be aware of. But you can, like Bob's Red Mill, and there's a couple of other places, I think one called Leona Valley, now uh, process their oats in designated gluten-free facilities. It's a huge excitement for people in the gluten-free arena. Um, but it, And then for, for casein, casein is a protein that's found in milk. So you pretty much have to eliminate dairy when you're eliminating casein, but it's amazing how many things casein can, can show up in that don't have milk. Um, a little on the scary side. And of course, a lot of people now do a GF, gluten-free, CF, casein-free, SF, soy-free diet. So let's just have those things understood. Gl gluten-free, casein-free, soy-free. And um, there have been a lot of studies done, and it depends on who you talk to. Unfortunately, um, it is not across the board the benefit um, if, from the studies that they'll they'll do a study on a group of children with autism and they'll put them on a gluten-free casein-free diet and what they come back with a lot of the time is saying you know we don't see a significant difference because some of the kids don't have a significant difference and other kids do and it sort of evens out to be not a great deal but I can tell you from personal experience with my personal child we put him on the gluten-free diet and we saw a huge change change and it was pretty quick and then when we put him on a week later when we took him off of casein we saw another huge change and it was huge. Um, I, I noticed that within four days of taking him off of gluten, my child, who had lost virtually all of his language, he was down to five words that weren't very functional. I remember being in the grocery store with him. And, you know, the former teacher in me, even though he hadn't learned a new word in months, I was still presenting things and saying, apple, apple, you know, and he would look over there and not say anything and I would die a little. Um, but we went to the grocery store about four days after we removed gluten and, and I held up a apple and he said, apple. And then I, you know, got something else and, you know, it's a peach and he peat, right? Uh, and was able to do five words with him in the grocery store. And I was shaking and getting my phone out and calling my husband and going, I, you know, I think now, is that going to be the case for every child? No. And there are even some kids that go on a gluten-free diet and they don't, you don't see a change for six months. And then suddenly there's a change. Um, now, I would also refer you to, if you're wondering, okay, so what does this have to do with autism? Again, not an expert, not a doctor, 
not a uh, parent, but I've been to enough ARI conferences uh, to be able to refer you to them. This is the Autism Research Institute, and they have all kinds of studies about gluten and casein and a little bit about soy to let you know. And if you go to any of their conferences, you will see slides of peptides, uh, of peptides of gluten and of casein. And what I can tell you and tell you to go do further research is that the peptides for gluten and casein are very closely related to the peptides for opiates. Um, there is one aspect of the, the peptide that is different. And so what we see in some children on the autism spectrum is that when their body takes these proteins in for whatever reason, they aren't able to break them down in the proper way. And there is, for some of our kids, an opiate effect from these items where they're fuzzed out. I mean, think about some, if you know anybody who has a substance abuse problem or, you know, think of giving somebody a pain pill and trying to teach them how to learn a new difficult skill when they're on a pain pill. They're not going to get it. They're going to be a little bit off. They're going to look like they're in their own world, right? And when we take our kids off of those opiate things, we see other things happen. Now, there's also the issue with uh, children's digestive tracts. And a lot of our kids on the autism spectrum have digestive tracts that are uh, in some way compromised. They're not working optimally. And there are lots of different ways that this can happen uh, where they're not breaking down the food properly or the kids are having diarrhea. They're having gut issues where they, they constantly press on their stomach. They're in pain. And imagine if you were going to go and learn something really difficult on a day when you were having big irritable bowel syndromes, that you were going to the bathroom and having diarrhea, um, you know, how likely would you be able to learn if you had those issues going on? So a lot of doctors who are medical doctors who treat kids with autism like to suggest to families that it's worth the try. I don't know that there is a conclusive test that you can do um, to see whether you know, a medical test to see whether a gluten-free, casein-free diet is going to have a big impact on your child. Because a lot of kids, they do an allergy test and they come back and there's no allergy to gluten, there's no allergy to milk, but still they, there is some benefit for them on the diet because of the opiate effect. Um, so a lot of doctors will suggest that if if your child is having gastrointestinal issues, um, if you're seeing some of those opiate uh, behaviors where your child's just fuzzed out, that it might be worth it to give it a try, give it a good college try. Here's the thing with that. You really can't be mamby-pamby about it. If you're going to try the gluten-free, casein-free, you got to really give it a, a, a good, clean try for at least six months, at least six months. And what some people report is they don't see any big difference in their child immediately, um, behaviorally, but after a period of time, their child seems a little bit healthier and they're not pressing on their stomach. And after six months, they're able to very slowly reintegrate the regular diet and with no big effects. Uh, lots of different opinions about this, but uh, I, I can tell you personally for my child, it made a world of difference. And I can also tell you that my husband and I poo-pooed it very quickly, even though I'm allergic to wheat. Uh, and even though there was this big behavior change and he was speaking, we very quickly got used to the new set of circumstances and we felt all this hope and, you know, we got busy teaching him new words and having less tantrums, frankly. And it wasn't until, and I remember at one point thinking, gosh, you know, we probably should try giving him some wheat or some milk to see if there's a reaction. I just couldn't do it. Like my stomach just couldn't do it, but I did. And I've talked about it before on the show. I took him to the YMCA and checked him into the kid care while I went to go work out on something. And, uh, they called me back and said, he has to leave. He's, you know, he was three 
and he's throwing things. I think he was just about to turn three. He hadn't quite turned three. He was throwing things. Uh, he was like spitting and seething like a, you know, doing like a kind of animal uh, behavior and just being scary. He was scaring them. He was a th not quite three and he was scaring a group of adults and small children. And they made me come and get him. And we hadn't had any of that behavior for a while. And I took him and I went home and uh, was really sad and upset. But, you know, we went through the weekend and the weekend I had this just child that was tantruming constantly and a danger to himself and a danger to me. And he was biting me. And I, I thought, oh, no. Well, clearly this wasn't the gluten in the casing because we've had no infraction. So I don't know what it is that we did that made him so much better for a while. And I went back to the gym on Monday, checked him into the child care again. And I always pinned a little thing to him that said, do not feed. Uh, allergies, right? It was pinned on him the whole time that he was there in childcare. And um, they, I went to work out and five minutes later they came and got me and said, you know, he, he can't be here and I don't know if he can ever be here again and this is just not acceptable and, you know, uh, he can't, he's not up for this. We're not up for this. And I, of course, started to cry. I was just devastated. And I walked him out to the parking lot and was just hugging him and feeling like they had rejected him. And I was kissing him and saying, it's okay. Mommy loves you. It's going to be okay. But I was just, you know, horrible. And one of the teenagers that worked at the child care came and said to me, I could lose my job for this, but I need you to know that they fed him pretzels on Friday. Oh my gosh. And I said, they did. Oh, thank you so much. And he said, you're thanking me because, you know, we, we were all told that we weren't supposed to feed him, but they fed him a bunch of pretzels on Friday. And, and I said, yes, but you've saved me because now I know what's causing this. Now I know for sure. And, uh, I still see that he was a teen then, but he's a grown man now. I still see that young man from time to time, and I thank him and say, you know, you saved me probably 10 years of heartache because I was thinking, well, I might as well go home and feed him weed if it's not going to make a difference because I didn't know that they'd had an inf a big infraction. So, uh, and we very quickly, you know, made sure that he wasn't, we didn't, we weren't, well, we weren't welcome at the gym anymore. Um, but... Uh, there was no more gluten in his diet and we were very quickly able to get back on an even keel where we weren't having those huge epic tantrums again. So that's my tale of gluten-free, um, but I hope that you'll look at gluten-free, casein-free, and also investigate soy-free. When we do our cooking segment with Lisa Ackerman, the recipes are GF, CF, SF. And you can find out all kinds of information. In fact, I want to also have you reference TACA, their website, TACANow.org. If you go there, uh, they have lots of tips for easy ways to go gluten-free. It doesn't have to be, it's a little bit more expensive. I mean, we're just going to be honest about that. Um, but it's a very healthy diet, very low in processed foods. And um, it it has the potential, uh, if you're willing to try it, it has the potential. A lot of us have reported that our kids changed as a result. For me, I always really say ABA was the big tipping point, but I will be honest with you that I know that if my child had started ABA before we had gotten him off of the gluten and casein, I don't know if we would be where we are because he, they would have had to deal with so much more behavior instead of teaching. Uh, and the gluten-free casein-free made it possible for him to be in a space where it was about learning. There was still some challenging behavior. It didn't wipe it out completely, but it made it much more uh, available to him to be in a teaching space really made a world of difference. So there you have it. I hope that answered your question. We are going to take a break, uh, and come back. Somebody said, I just started on IBT this month and loving the website. I just love that. IBT is awesome and easy to use for anyone. I am a man with CP myself and it is the most helpful. Mike, I didn't know that you had started on IBT. I'm thrilled to know that. Um, 
And I, Mike, I hope you're still with us today because after we do the A word, I'm going to tell about this amazing event that we went to and some amazing kids that I met that I talked to them about you, Mike. Uh, so I hope, I hope you're still with us and haven't left. In any case, it is time to go to the A word. This is the amazing ongoing documentary being made here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders following a little boy, Jack Riley, who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. Uh, so let's take a look. Let's see what Jack Riley is up to this week. This is The A Word. I know a cute little blue-eyed boy, and his name is Jack. Jack Riley. He got a big, warm, blue-eyed soul that makes your heart beat fast. So Jack Riley is starting preschool, and we're scared because it's a big classroom. He'll have a full-time aide for at least the first month, and then we'll see what happens after that. Is he in a classroom with typical peers or mixed yeah, classroom? It's, it's a mixed classroom. To be honest with you, I don't think they love him yet. You guys, you guys always treat him with love. How many teachers are there in the classroom with them? Uh, there's two and a couple assistants, and uh, one who's supposed to be Jack's assistant, but we think she's just reassigned at the last minute to pretend she's Jack's assistant. We're gonna, in fact, try to observe a little today. After Jack Riley has been in school for 30 days, Cheryl and Mike have an IEP meeting with the school district. An IEP is an individualized education plan. It's a legal binding document that outlines plans and goals for a child. We went to our IEP the other day and it did not go as badly as we thought it would. What they're ultimately trying to do is to take away a lot of the structured speech and OT time. They guised it under the fact that uh, most of his needs ha are social related. What they're trying to do is do a lot of what they call push-ins, which is doing his speech therapy in the classroom. The more I think about it, the more I think that that's what should be happening in the classroom at all other times. Part of our concern is too is that we won, won two hours of OT during the due process and they've never given it to us. For us now to allow them to reduce it to 90 minutes with never having even gotten the two hours. Did the IEP affect the ABA he was getting? No, the ABA right now is being provided by our regional center because uh, I have a self-funded insurance plan that denied ABA coverage. So it is being provided by the regional center, but that's contingent upon us getting a certain amount of services from the school district. So it's all, it's all so interconnected and so scary because if one slips, then the other one does too. That's the A word. And we're talking this week about making it work. This is kismet that this, this is the episode that we're looking at this week because you see this family and let's be honest, they are incredibly fortunate because they have been able to find the way to get access to ABA. And we're going to be talking about how everybody needs to do that no matter what their circumstances are in just a little while. But even once you have access to ABA and you've figured that part of it out, there are still other parts to the puzzle. We've talked to our question of the day is how do you feel about inclusion? And so here is Jack Riley. He started preschool and he's in a class that is very mixed. So it's very included. There's neurotypical peers. There's other kids that are on the spectrum. And, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting reality for mom and dad to shift these gears and to be going to school and that you, at a certain point, you need to start working with the school district and you gotta make it work. And I, I love this family uh, because they're amazing, hopeful, upbeat people who are willing to be honest when it isn't all hearts and flowers and roses. I love, uh, I love both of them, but I always talk about this, this dad and his ability. I think women are inherently more able, I, I'm gonna stereo, uh, do stereotypes here, but women tend to be more willing to talk about the emotional components of things. And I think, uh, the vast majority of us are, are more willing in certain settings to just go there and be honest and go, look, you know. Uh, but I, I, in general, it's hard to get the dads to be that open. And so for the dad to be there, and it's obviously early morning and his hair is standing straight up and he's just keeping it real and saying, you know, I just don't think that everybody loves my child as much as you guys do. Oh, it's just it's real, right? Uh, and then to hear the mom, Cheryl, talking about, you know, we go to these IEP meetings and they're saying this, and I'm thinking this, and how do we reconcile these two things together? Uh, when a parent calls me, I am, you know, not a licensed advocate, but 
parents call all the time and please feel free to to write in and 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 talk about whatever you want to talk about but when we talk about IEPs one of the first things that I always ask a parent is what is it you want what is your gut telling you that you want because usually that's when a parent's instinct is exactly right. And it's different. You know, I mean, what I wanted for my child at the first IEP was that I wanted him to do an early intensive ABA at home and I wanted him to do a 40 hour program. And, and didn't matter who, uh, we've had Emily Island before on the show. Emily Island, who's a great, uh, she's not doing advocacy anymore, but for a lot of years she did advocacy all over the United States. People flew her places to go to IEP meetings with her. And, and Emily Island lives in, in the same town that I do. And somebody gave me her phone number and said, call her. And, and I called Emily and I said, you know, here's the school district. Here's what I want. And she said, oh, you know, can I, can I talk to you about maybe you want to do X, Y, or Z? And I said, you can talk to me about that, but it doesn't change the fact that that's not what I'm going for. And she said, okay, well, you know, you got an uphill battle. She said, I completely understand why that's what you want, but you know, you have an uphill battle, right? And I said, yeah, but that's what we're going to get because that was my instinct. And, uh, sometimes with autism, my instincts are not right, but I do think that for the most part, our, our parent instincts. And so when I hear Cheryl saying in the A words, you know, it's my instinct that when they're saying, well, we want to do a push in to work on speech at this time, that really that's what you should be doing all the time. I, I, I feel like that's the answer. Uh, so we'll see how this plays out, uh, with school, but it really is an interesting time and her talking about the fact that they won a certain amount of OT and that the school was not, the school district was not in compliance. And I shared with you guys last week that, uh, as painful as that is in the moment, there is a silver lining in that when the school does something that they are clearly not in compliance with a legal document, you got them. And so it's my hope that they're working with a really good lawyer who is making sure that all the screws get turned and the bolts get turned so that they get what they need to have. I really want to encourage you to watch the A word, uh, wherever you need to, the, you know, there are different places where you can drop in, whether it's that you're starting toilet training and you want to see when they were toilet training, uh, Jack Riley, or you want to see when he started school, like today's episode, or, you know, where you want to see where the parents, what they were doing before their services started, drop in and watch. It's, it's a fascinating series, and I think it's, it's a really good depiction of one family's journey and the things that they have to deal with, like figuring out, here she says, I, we, my insurance was declined because it was self-funded, so we went and got it from this place, because uh, you have to find a way to make it work. It has not been easy for this family. Um, and they're one of the lucky ones, but it still has not been easy. So check out the A word. I hope that you will. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the two events that we were, the two different places that we went to over the weekend and filmed. We weren't with you on Friday and then we were filming on Saturday. I want to tell you a little bit about that so that I can, uh, t uh, tell Mike about the, the lovely, some of the lovely people that we met. So stick with us and more on autism 101 and the funding part a little bit later. So don't go away. Hi, welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Lisa Ackerman, Executive Director of TACA. We're going to bake again. All right. It's my lovely assistant. Hi, I'm Jennifer Lucero. We've heard so many people go, I want a decent chocolate chip cookie for my kid to eat. We've got our, um, all our dry ingredients, so I've got the flour, I've got the flaxseed meal, baking soda, baking powder, our gum, or xanthan gum. Great. So we're going to get started in the mixer here. So those are dry ingredients. Um, I do have uh, brown sugar. We did cut this down. And the one way to do that is my favorite, and that's maple syrup. I'm using egg for this recipe, but we could use more um, uh, arrowroot and also um, the flaxseed meal. So I'll go ahead and throw my eggs in here, which I love doing. So and then the last thing is a shortening and a gluten-free, casein-free butter replacement. So I'm going to go ahead and throw this in. 
Um, I've let it sit out for a while so it's nice and soft. So let's go ahead and mix this thing well. These are dairy-free, soy-free, and I really like them. Again, Enjoy Life is a great product. It's also nut-free. And chocolate chips are a personal thing. I won't judge you if you use the whole bag. I would. I know, right? <laughs> So here we go. Great recipe. It's the nice consistency. Um, everything's ready to go so we can enjoy our cookies here in just about 10 minutes. We want to give it a kind of like a couple inches between each cookie. You know, a lot of people are really concerned about aluminum. So what I've done is I laid down my uh, natural brown um, parchment paper and Jen's helping out putting the cookies down. So we're separating uh, the nice big good that's all organic uh, from the aluminum cookie sheets. So let's go put these Great. in. So magic oven allows me to pull the last ones out. And voila. Yum, that's good. Really great cookies. I'll let you have a bite so you can do my Vanna White there too. Mm. Yeah, these taste pretty good. good. Really good. Mm. We're going to come back later after I gain five pounds and <laughs> eat this entire tray. For sure. You know, more feedback is good. So if there's something you want us to convert, like yeah. a, another recipe or maybe a relative main, just let us know. AutismLive at gmail.com. You can go to Facebook. Or there's thousands of recipes on the TACA website just waiting for you to explore. You can go to TACANOW, T-A-C-A-N-O-W dot O-R-G. And we'll see you next time at Autism Live. Bye. Welcome back to Autism Live. I wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about the kinds of things that we went and did. We weren't here on Friday uh, because we were going to fr film at a very special location. There is a place in Los Angeles. It's part of the Griffith Park uh, area, and um, it's land in Los Angeles. If you've ever been to Los Angeles, you know, it's a, it's a pretty big city. And, and yet there is a lot of area that's just green, and there, I think it was gifted to the city this big area that's called Griffith Park and the Griffith Park Park Observatory is there. The LA Zoo is there. The Griffith Park Park Observatory, you probably recognize it from a lot of different films, probably the most famous, uh, Rebel Without a Cause. Uh, but really amazing place to be able to take your family. There's a dog park. There's lots of, there's a carousel. You know, there's lots of different things you can do there. And one of the, uh, I think, greatest kept secrets in Los Angeles, there's a place called Travel Town. And it is is a steam engine museum that is open every day of the year except for Christmas Day. Every day of the year except for Christmas Day. It's free. It's open from 10 to 4. And it's a place where old trains that when they were being retired, real trains, huge mammoth real trains were gifted to the city. They put them there. They build a little bit more on every year. There's a gift shop, but there's these trains and the kids on some of them, some of them are too old at this point, but the kids get to scramble on them and look at the, you know, the boilers and things and pretend they're conductors and, uh, play on train tracks. Cause when can you do that? And it's a wonderful place for everyone, but we know that a lot of our kids on the autism spectrum are really particularly into trains. So imagine having this as a resource. And it's one of those things that parents talk about and go, oh, you know, you've been to Travel Town. But once you're an autism parent and you're in Los Angeles, everybody goes, oh, you've been to Travel Town, haven't you? Because it's a free place to go where your child can, it's gated, right? So you can kind of let your child run a little bit loose. You can't, you know, totally walk away from them, but you don't have to constantly be on them. You know, they, there's a grassy areas where they can run and play and it, it's very reinforcing for them. And so we were thrilled to be able to go, and we want to thank the people at Travel Town because they were truly amazing. And they gave us a great tour. We videotaped all of it. It's going to be coming to you guys in a couple of weeks. But it was so lovely. And uh, then on Saturday, we were invited to go to a really special event in Palmdale, California, uh, for Saddle Up. It's a, a therapeutic horse riding organization 
was very amazing to go to this. It was their first big fundraiser. It was a dinner, and you got to see kids riding horses. And when we first got there, first the first thing I noticed, and Suzanne's going to laugh because I kept bringing this up over and over and over again. I've been around horses before. I grew up in Saratoga, New York. I've been around horses, and I've certainly been on ranches. And, you know, where there's horses, there is poop. Let's just <laughs> call it what it is, right? And there is a certain odor that comes with animal poo. Horses are not exempt to that. And Palmdale is a particularly windy, dry place, so I was prepared for the smell of horse poo. And they were having a dinner, and, you know, this, I don't know about the rest of you, but eating and horse poo smell, for me, they just do not go together, right? So this is the mental place that I came to saddle up. And we had a park and walked just a little way because there were a lot of people there, so there was a parking situation, and you had to walk a ways. And at one point, Suzanne said, I don't know which way we're supposed to go. And I said, well, we should just follow the poo smell. But there wasn't one. There was no poo smell. And then we found our way into the ranch, this beautiful, beautiful, very small, but lovely ranch with some beautiful horses. And there was no poo smell. <laughs> and, and I saw that where they were going to feed people was right next to the horses. And, and I was going, that's just bizarre. And then as I talked to all the individual parents there, they were saying, you know, and this is why we love this place. And this is why we love this place. And did you notice there's no poo smell? Because imagine, you know, I'm very uh, reactive to the poo smell. Imagine our sensory kids, right? You're going to get them to learn and there's horses. Poo anyway, they have a great secret there. They cling constantly. Uh, and they have this core of volunteers that works there. And we got to talk to some of them, these teenagers. I'll tell you what, just took my breath away. These these kids starting at the age of 13, and some of them were 19 and 20 that had been working there for all since they were 13 years old, really remarkable kids who want to be of service. They're volunteers, and they can't wait to come out to the ranch. It's like their cool place to be with other cool kids. Talked to some parents of some of the volunteers. Just amazing. Um, and then we got to talk to some of the families and some of the kids who participated in the horseback therapy. Okay. Took my breath away. One of the first kids that I met, Nick, who I want to say Nick was 12. I think he was 11 or 12. And, uh, I thought of you, Mike and I, uh, Mike Kipple, who joins us a lot of time because, uh, Nick has cerebral palsy as well. And he had had a very big day that morning. He had been, uh, skateboarding earlier in the morning with an organization that only works with people who are wheelchair bound. And, uh, it's an organization that he's been able to go skateboard riding before. So he'd done skateboarding in the morning and then he came and did horseback riding at, in the evening. And Nick was the first person that I got to see on the horse and a grin that just took my breath away. Uh, really, really remarkable young man and, uh, got to talk to his mom. What a lovely, lovely lady and a friend of his that he calls aunt. And, uh, anyway, I told them about you, Mike, and, uh, the mom was telling me that the, the school had gotten him an iPad, so he's communicating through the iPad now. Nick uh, is is able to do that. And, and I talked about you, Mike, and how important it is to give kids an, as early of an start as possible with a device. And uh, so I just want you to know that you came up in conversation, uh, Mike, and it was really amazing to see these kids uh, with all different abilities. Uh, the, you know, so there were there were kids there with many different things going on. Some kids who were in wheelchairs, some kids who weren't. All of them were getting that core strength, getting therapeutic horseback riding and the grins. You just could not argue with grins. In fact, while we were there and we were interviewing people, there was a news outlet that interviewed me. Uh, while we were there. And one of the questions that the guy asked me, he said, uh, you know, why is this a good thing for autism? And I said, because anything that builds self-esteem is a great thing. And anything that builds core strength is good for all of our kids, right? And the horse is so reinforcing for a lot of our kids. Animals are reinforcing. And there's something about horses. Horses are majestic. They're just amazing. And, uh, and he said, oh, that's really interesting. Are there any studies 
that show that uh, therapeutic course. And I said, you know, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done the research on that, but I will tell you that as a parent, you don't have to be a scientist to see that it's reinforcing to these kids, to see them grin until their face is going to crack. And then you start to grin too, because they're having such a good time. Um, and we know science does show that if there is some element of something that's reinforcing, kids are going to be more likely to do it. And I, I mean, I think that's the beginning and the end of the conversation. If the horse is reinforcing to the kid, duh, right? <laughs> it works. Um, if it isn't reinforcing to them, then, you know, it's going to be an uphill battle no matter what. But to see the grins on those kids' faces, it was just, just amazing. amazing. And to see the strength that they were gaining. Uh, Nick, who is in a wheelchair, and the things that he was able to do on that horse, really, really inspirational. Uh, and we met an awesome autism family that we're going to be featuring a little bit, uh, you know, in the coming weeks. Because I, I, I met, as I said, I've never met an autism parent that I haven't liked. And I met uh, a wonderful woman on Saturday that, you know how you just go, okay, this is, this is going to be a friend for life. Really, a re really amazing mom was able to talk to her and what she's doing in her community for autism, what she's doing for her son. And we also interviewed her daughter uh, because she has twins. Her son is on the spectrum and her daughter is not. And her daughter, Gracie, who I think they're nine now, the twins. And Gracie talked to us about what it's like to be a sibling. So really, really lovely. Can't wait to show you that video. All right. We're going to take a break and we're going to come back and we're going to dismantle the funding thing. This is Autism 101. We're talking about how do we make it work? And the funding is a part of it. If you're thinking, well, Shannon, you know, therapy or coach back writing sounds just lovely. How am I going to afford that? Let's talk about that when we come back. Stick with us. Skills is an online program that provides assessment, curriculum, positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior, and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The Skills Assessment and Curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes Skills the only ABA based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. Skills is a four step system. Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The skills assessment is the only ABA based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions. Or simply type in a keyword, find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step 3. Choose activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step 4. Start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, and edit an activity status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The Skills Language Curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, tax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills. Progress starts here.
Welcome back to Autism Live. I've been promising you that we were going to take apart the funding and do an Autism 101 on this. And I want to just preface it by saying that, you know, when you're starting out at whatever point you're at, it's really important that you manage your resources. We talked earlier about managing the stress. You got to manage the resources too. Uh, a lot of autism parents that I know have what we all finally refer to as the list. What is it you want to do? Uh, what's on your list? And it's different for every child. Uh, I, I said earlier that I'm going to make the case for ABA, that there are many of you that, uh, there were two people on Facebook over the weekend that just broke my heart that were, got a little defensive and said, you know, we're not doing ABA. I understand. I said that at one point, but I, I hope that you'll rethink it. If it is a question of, the, you know, you, you literally can't just afford it. I want you to know none of us can and none of us could. And that if you're, if you were thinking that you were going to do it on your own funds, let go of that. Let's talk about how you're going to do it. And that there's no, I can't think of any earthly reason why everyone shouldn't be doing ABA other than the funding aspect. Yes, it will. It's a schedule and you got to figure out how to manage that. But you know, the truth of the matter is, is we know it's effective. So we will figure out how to manage the schedule, right? Um, okay. So let's take apart the funding. Cause I think that's the biggest, other than the fact that, you know, it may not, you may not have a provider close to you, which we'll talk about in a second, but let's take apart the funding on it. How are you going to make this work? You're going to manage your resources. So let's imagine on your list of things that you have to do for your, your child with autism, you, you really want to get to a certain conference and you put that on the list. You really want to start an ABA. You, uh, let's say you want to do some biomedical intervention and you want to pay for, uh, you know, whether it's a piano lesson or a soccer lesson or therapeutic horseback riding, you got, you know, make the list. Maybe you want to do HBOT, maybe, um, you know, uh, whatever is on your list. There's so many things to talk about, right? Make your list of all the things that you would like to do and keep the list someplace. I know people who have it on a board on, on the wall and it's visible to everybody who comes in. Other people have it in a no notebook, but make your list, know what's on there and then prioritize and, and prioritize in terms of bang for buck about what's possible to start now, what, what, how, and maybe how much money you need to start it or what's the next step that you need to do to start it. Um, you know, I know it was on my list of things for a long time that I wanted to be able to do the methyl B12 shots and that it took me a while to get to the place where I was comfortable with it. I thought my son was ready and that we had the financial wherewithal to take that on on a monthly basis because that can be expensive too. So you've got your list, right? And you're prioritizing and going, okay, this is something I really want to do, but it's not possible right now, or this is in the way or whatever it is. Um, money is going to be a big part of it. And then as you're looking at your list, uh, you can start to ask yourself, okay, what is there potential for me to get funding in a fairly quick way? I would tell you that for those of you who are out there that it's high on your list that you want an iPad for your child, whether it's so that your child can speak or it's because you know that there are apps out there that you want your child to be, you know, learning and having that, uh, in their lives. Uh, and by the way, it's not just iPads, it's tablets because there are lots of tablets. We're going to be talking about the Nobby, which I'm very excited about. So it's not just iPads anymore, but you want that kind of technology for your child. Um, so I would tell you that there are lots of grant programs that are out there that are just for iPads and just for devices. Nobby has uh, a, a, the, you can request uh, and fill out a grant replica. Uh, they, have, they have a program called Inspire and we're going to be covering that. In fact, we're going to have Holly Robinson Pete come and talk about that. Uh, but, and it's Nobby, N-A-B-I. You can put in a request for their Inspire program to see if you qualify for a grant. We've talked before on the show about iTalk, T-I-T-A-A-L-K, I-T-A-A-L-K. LK.com or .org. I think it's both. Um, and that they not only give grants for, uh, to, uh, 
pad technology, tablet technology. They also will train families and schools on how to get the most out of that technology, which I think is brilliant. Um, and they also have a website called Tuesday's Treasures where you can see other organizations that sponsor um, that you can get a grant for a tablet. Uh, we always talk about ACT Today here, Autism Care and Treatment Today. Now, Autism Care and Treatment Today is one of those resources that you want to look at. And if you want an iPad, I would say to you, let's think rationally about this. Well, iTalk gives grants for iPads and they don't give grants for other things besides knowing how to use the iPad. If you know on your list, you need to get a bunch of testing done biomedically to see what biomedically your child might need. And you know that that's going to run you a couple of grand and you just don't have it, let's say, but you know, you also want an iPad. Be smart. Ask for the iPad from iTalk or ask for a Nobby from Inspire at Nobby and then put in a grant request from Act Today to get the, the funds to be able to do that biomedical. You're going to manage your resources because Act Today, you can put in a, in a grant request for whatever you need. If you need a trampoline, you can put in a request for a trampoline and detail why the physician is saying a trampoline is going to help your child uh, with their sensory vestibular issues, right? Uh, <clears throat> so you can do that. Um, and before, maybe before you start looking at all these different places that give grants, the first place to start is looking at, do you have the potential to have something, something paid for by your insurance? Now, for a lot of you that are out there, it's very likely that at this moment in time, your insurance would pay for ABA. I know that that's stunning because there are many of you out here out there who think, no, I know because I checked it six months ago and I would say to you, you need to be checking it pretty much on like an every three month basis. Uh, I check mine every six months. Like Cheryl from the A word, we're on my husband's insurance. Uh, that's not like Cheryl, <laughs> but our, my husband's insurance is self-funded. And so we do not have ABA services through my husband's insurance, but I check on a regular basis because it's going to shift at some point. And believe me, I'll tell you when it does. Uh, but it's going to shift at some point. So you have to stay on it. And it may be that you say, well, my state doesn't provide it, except that these things shift. You can go to autismvotes.org to know what your state's current laws are. But keep in mind that there are several insurance companies that because they're in multiple states, maybe your insurance, your, maybe your state doesn't cover it, but your insurance company already made an agreement to cover cover it if you have that insurance because they don't want a lawsuit from you because they paid for it in California and they're not paying for it in Utah. So you really, and I would encourage you not to take that on entirely yourself. Whoever the APA, ABA provider is that you're talking about going through should help you to sort that out. Um, I know that CAR does that and I know that there are many other ABA providers. It's in their best interest to help you sort that out. Um, because that, let's be honest, the insurance companies have the deepest pockets and it is the law of the land in many cases that your child qualifies. You've paid your insurance premium so that your child will be covered in case of juvenile diabetes or if they get cancer or if they get autism. So utilize that money, go to that source first, and then be managing the resources after that. Now, if you've checked in the last three months and you know that your insurance company is not paying for ABA, then you got to make some choices. And if that's the highest thing on your list, um, you know, let's, let's say that you also on your list is the iPad and also on your list is a fence because your child is eloping and you're worried about the safety of your child. What I would advocate is ask for iTalk for the iPad um, or go to Nobby and ask them in their Inspire program to cover an, a Nobby and ask Act Today for the grant for the, um, the fence. And while you're asking Act Today for the grant for the fence, ask for a grant for IBT, ask for a grant for skills. And in that way, you can start an ABA program in your home. You can get volunteers uh, that you train with what you learned from IBT. You take the curriculum from skills and you, it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a lot of work, but you'll have the tools 
And there was a time when you couldn't even have had that. Um, and, and I would tell you that if you're, if you're ready to start today, um, you can do the IBT. I mentioned that as low as $7.50, you could learn something about autism today that could help you with your child today. Um, Skills is a monthly subscription, and you can do a 14-day free trial. You really could get started today and, and see what you can affect change-wise for your child. That's a much harder road to hoe than the insurance, but we've heard from so many families that have implemented skills and done that. I don't know if we have the Maddie video to show, but have it been able to implement skills as the stopgap while you're waiting for insurance to kick in? Or you, you're, I talked earlier about that space when I was getting the testing done, but we, our funding source hadn't kicked in yet. And then I was saying, what can I do? And I was told, well, you know, you could try the diet. And now I would not only be trying the diet, but I would be taking classes from IBT and starting on skills. I absolutely would. I would tell you that there, I believe this with all of my being, and I want you to prove me wrong, that there is a way for everyone within the sound of my voice to be doing something to create progress with a child on the autism spectrum, and it is within your financial means. Um, it may take a couple of months for you to, to be able to get a grant to make all of it possible, but you really can start today because you can do the free trial on skills. And, and I really would love it if there would be no one within the sound of my voice who says, we can't afford it. And that's the end of the discussion. That's the period at the end of the, sun, the sentence, because it, it can't be. It just absolutely can't be. Can you imagine a parent who says, yes, we found out today that our child has a brain tumor and we, we can't afford it. So we're not going to do anything. It wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen because society has told us we don't do that. We get up and we do things. Unfortunately, for, you know, how many decades people have said, oh, autism, oh, it's game over. It isn't. As Lisa Ackerman says, it is not game over. It's game on. Now, I would also tell you, too, that a lot of us have done fundraisers. We did this with my son. One fundraiser that my son, my husband and I had early on, that was how we raised the money to get the biomedical tests because the money was not there. I didn't know about ACT today. I didn't know about it. I just didn't know about it. So we had a fundraiser, and that was how we raised the money for him to not only get the testing, to, but to pay for the first year of biomedical intervention and the doctor and, you know, and, and getting all that in line. Um, that was how we did that. And then a little bit later, we had friends who, unbeknownst to us, did a fundraiser for us. Uh, you know, no words there. Um, really kind of a, 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 kind of, it was a miracle in our lives at that time. I don't know what we would have done, but I didn't know about ACT today. There was no such thing as I talk. Nobby wasn't around. Um, I would tell you that you could do all of those things and do a fundraiser. And, and I've talked to so many different people about what kind of fundraiser they've done. Anything from a bake sale to a garage sale, a, like a, a community wide garage sale and raise the money that way. They've done car washes, uh, one really neat lady who took a bunch of puzzle pieces and, uh, and she took pin backs and she put a bunch of like, you know, sequins and things. And, uh, with a little, little piece of paper that she printed up and said, you know, this, uh, decorate this autism pin and wear it. And then she sold them. Uh, I, I know of one person who sold them for $5 a piece and said, here, it's a fundraiser. And then you make the pin and then you wear it. Another person who sold them for a dollar. So, you know, you can set your own price, but you know, people loved them. They were like, I want to decorate my pin. I want all the pins were different and they got the money for it. So, uh, you know, we, we did an evening where we did a, a silent auction and we asked a bunch of our friends cause we have very talented friends, uh, and they performed and we, so we did an, uh, a show. It was dinner theater <laughs> and, and it, and I've said it before. I'll say it again. It was life changing for us because it's so hard for me to ask for help. I know we all struggle with that. It was so hard for me to admit I can't do this on my own. My husband and I don't have the wherewithal to do this on our own. And and I I had some fear and some embarrassment about it. And yet we went and had the event. And all these people showed up and said, "Thank you so much for doing this because I've wanted to say something, and I've wanted to be helpful, and I haven't known what." to do. And this was a lovely thing that I could come to and know that I participated. So don't be afraid to ask for help. If you know somebody who's got a business and say, could you, could you sponsor, you want to do it at your place, 
they'll love it. The free publicity that they get from it, believe me, it'll be a, it'll be you doing them a favor. So uh, we make it work. There are lots of financial resources out there. There are lots of things on your list. Prioritize, your, make your list, prioritize and say, here's what we need to do. Here's what we need to have that. What do I have in my resource bag? What would solve this? And then get moving. We can make it work. We absolutely can. All right, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back with more. Stick with us. When Maddie was diagnosed, I'll be honest, I was very ignorant on what autism was. I knew that autism was basically something that hit boys at the age of two to three and shut down. And sometimes you think of the typical Rain Man uh, movie. Um, and with Maddie, she was doing all the same signs and symptoms of a, of a typical child with autism spectrum disorder. Stand up. didn't even acknowledge us coming into the room. Um, she had barely any eye contact. Um, she didn't interact with her sister. She didn't really do anything. She just basically lined up her toys and that was about it. We have a team of seven volunteers, or, or eight now, we have eight volunteers, including my husband and I, and I'm the team leader, and so I do all the curriculum and get everything ready each week. Jana was downstairs until 11 o'clock at night working on curriculum, going through two different textbooks. And then we, as a group, meet on Monday nights, and we would go through what the curriculum was from Jana. And a lot of times we would go, well, how exactly do you do that? How do you sit her at the table and, and do this trial base? Well, what skills has done for us, it's, it's taken that away from Jana trying to figure out the curriculum for one, she can go down, or on our, even on our laptop, and she can sit down and through all these questions, it comes up with the different programs. At least for me, it was a relief off my shoulders. I was worried that I might be missing something, um, missing a curriculum that maybe she needs to know, where skills, they have every, every possible thing your child needs to know from zero to seven. They have a program for that. What noise is this? <laughs> Every program that we did with her, I knew it was specific for what she needed to learn. Because before skills, it was a lot of, okay, well, is that really age appropriate for a two-year-old? You know, because it's not generalized. It's anywhere from zero to seven. This is what your child needs to know in most, in most manuals you'll find. Um, but for this, okay, yep, yeah, she should be learning this. And no, she's not four yet. She doesn't need to know that yet. We are so fortunate that Jana was able to attend a conference put on by CARD that opened the door for skills and that um, there's no looking back for us. We started using the program in November and it seemed like by January something just clicked and she has completely kind of came out of her fog that she was in for quite a while. I have never read a documented case on any child that has not benefited anything from applied behavior analysis and uh, now with this new skills and being you know, like the E version of ABA, I can't imagine it doing anything harmful to their child. It, it's nothing but exponential growth for us. To see her now, it, is, it just blows us away when we call her our little miracle child because um, in seven months time, she has just blossomed into this normal, functioning child, and suddenly, we joke about it all the time, like suddenly we have twins. If you're even thinking about doing it, do it, because the absolute worst thing you can do is do nothing at all. And even if you use this program and it's just a single mom or a single dad working in the evenings with their child, this program is going to benefit them. It's, it's going to show you where they are, it's going to show you where they need to go, and it's going to show you what skills and how to get there. It is an online book on how to help recover your child. Welcome back. 
We uh, were talking about Maddie earlier, I think a great example of a family who was too far away from ABA services and said, we're going to make it work. We are going to make it work. And so they did. Uh, really inspirational. I wanted to talk a little bit about the question of the day today. Our question was, what do you think of inclusion? I wanted to know your opinions. And it was, it's very interesting, the things that you guys wrote. Uh, one mom wrote, I'm all for it. Unfortunately, my daughter is too far behind. Somebody else who says, it depends on what time type of inclusion. If it's academically, then it depends on the level the child is at. I'm experiencing with my son a push to keep up with others, and he just can't and feels under pressure, causing all sorts of stress on him, and he's only seven. Uh, inclusion in social groups, building friendships and group activities, sports camps, etc., definitely yes. Uh, somebody else who wrote in and said, what is inclusion? We'll talk about that in just a second. Someone else who says, being with held from the group causes problems. I'm all for inclusion that promotes healthy functioning. And then another person who says it depends on the child. Uh, it depends on the child. Is sitting with a teaching assistant all day inclusion? Hardly any social interaction. My son attends a special school, doesn't feel left out, and is included in every activity. Someone else who says full inclusion is hard to achieve, but it is definitely worth a shot. Uh, Another person says, if it's me, play, definitely. Academics, this will depend on the child's abilities. Uh, someone else who says inclusion, it's not easy, but it's by far better than exclusion. But then it is also a case of the level of severity. Mild cases like myself find it easier to socialize and to adapt to the norms imposed by neurotypicals. And another person who says, I feel like kindergarten to fourth grade is easy to do. When your child is going into the middle years. 10 to 16 years is the most difficult time for everyone. And I was saying at the beginning of the show that I'm, I'm really uh, coming around to a much more global perspective about inclusion. And uh, my son is just now 10, and I'm realizing that, you know, I... It's not easy to say it's just this. Like it's like I used to think of it as just yellow. It's just yellow. And now I'm seeing, you know, no, there's like there are many different shades of this yellow. And that while my son is full, fully included right now, that may not be best for him in junior high and high school. And that I will be forced as a parent to have to think about my child's needs and the things I'm always asking everybody else to do. Let's look at him as an individual and see what he needs, not this cookie cutter approach. And so I, I, my mind has been a little bit expanded on the inclusion thing to realize, okay, there are different circumstances, different kids, different locations and different peers. That's a part of it, too. Our, uh, you know, I listened to Nancy talk, Nancy Elspaugh Jackson, about the school that her son is at. And I want the kids at her school. Uh, which is not to say I love the kids at my son's school. I absolutely love them. Um, but they're struggling with some issues uh, about how do I carry myself and how do I, how am I loving and kind to myself and how am I loving and kind to another person? And what's the most important thing? How cool do I need to be? And that that's a hard thing. Boy, I can remember that that was a hard thing for me to figure out. And at Nancy's school, uh, Nancy's son goes to a private Christian Christian school, and it does not seem like they're struggling with that there. I, I don't, you know, I'm all about my son going to a very publicly, public and diverse school, but, you know, there's a, there's a drawback to that sometimes. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of, I, I want for my son to see that how other people, because there are kids that my son goes to school with that they've got some stuff, right? Autism isn't what's, what they're battling, but They've got challenges of their own, very real challenges that they show up at school with that make them angry. Um, and I, I want to be kind and cognizant of those things. But if it's not what's best for him, we'll have to look at that. And some days, man, it's hard. Uh, but I also... Uh, mindful of the fact that I'm friends with more and more individuals who are on the spectrum themselves. And, and one friend on Facebook who wrote a couple of weeks ago about going to an event, an all day event and being so exhausted, uh, 
when they got home from having to fit in socially uh, and having to be in a brain that was not their typical Asperger brain to fit in with the rest of us. And it really, uh, I thought, wow, because I know sometimes when I go and I'm out and having to be social that... I'm a very shy person. I know it doesn't seem like it. And it's taxing for me, but I'm sure nothing like what it is if I were on the spectrum. And it just gave me an appreciation that I thought, okay, I don't think I've really thought about that before, about how difficult it is to fit in on a day-to-day basis, uh, rough stuff. So, you know, each child, each school, each skill level, each circumstances, and we look at it and, and ask ourselves. I love, we had uh, Elizabeth du, uh, Duge on the other day, who was one of the recipients of Teacher of the Year Award this last year, and she works with kids on the spectrum. That's her classroom is full of kids on the spectrum. And what a remarkable young woman. Oh, if you missed that interview, you'll have to catch it. She was really, really remarkable. And she said that there was a shift that she, when she was preparing over the summer, that she decided that the main question she was going to ask herself every day is, am I setting this child up for success? And that everything that she did was going to be filtered through that. And I thought, well, amen to that. As a parent, you know, that's a really important thing for, and I think we all have that program running somewhere in the back of our heads, but to bring it to the forefront and ask ourselves, am I setting my child up for success? Is what I'm doing setting them up for success? And that includes inclusion. It's not about what it looks like. It's not about what it feels like when we're telling, you know, Aunt Margaret, oh, yes, he's fully included. It's about am I setting him up for success? You know, puts it in a different light. All right, we're going to take a break and come back for one more segment. We're going to talk a little bit about getting started, making it work, getting started on ABA. Stick with us. Currently in the United States, one in 88 children is affected by autism. One in 88 means something different when your child is the one. Recovery is possible. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, host of Autism Live, an online show about autism broadcast by CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I'm also the mother of a child with autism, my beautiful son, Jem. You know our old joke, guess what? Chicken butt. Chicken butt. So we're going to take the chickens. But things weren't always so easy. I remember when Jem was first diagnosed with autism. I used to lay awake at night in bed and pray for someone or something that could help us to get our child back. My prayers were answered by Dr. Doreen Grandpichet and the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. CARD treats autism and other related disorders using the principles of ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, which is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. It is also recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the U.S. Surgeon General. About a year after we started treatment with CARD, we were able to see tremendous improvement, and we got our child back. What grade are you in? Second. You are a smart cookie, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you like school? Uh, yeah. Do you have any good friends? Yeah, Oscar. Oscar is your best friend? Yeah. And my child is just one of thousands to benefit from CARD ABA therapy. Across the nation and around the world, children are making amazing progress and being given the keys to unlock their full potential. We are extremely grateful for the amazing job CARD has done in helping our daughter. Our daughter today, just in four months, I think is a totally different child than when she started with CARD. I kind of see it as, it, it seems like her brain in a way was asleep and now that we've gotten so many services, uh, we've seen her wake up. Did you have some gases? <laughs> Recovery is possible if you take the right steps, um, if you're willing to put in all the hard work and seven and a half years, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It's worth every little bit and um, CARD's been there with us every step of the way. I have two children with autism. I can't imagine a day without CARD or the therapists. Um, they've been so instrumental in helping us with our kids and, and 
shaping their lives and helping us help them. Thank you, Christy and Big Alex. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie and Mariana. We've tried other things before ABA, but the most beneficial thing has been ABA services, and I'd be the first person to tell any newly diagnosed family that you have to, you have to contact an ABA provider. And if you're lucky enough to have a card, you're very blessed. Recovery from autism is absolutely a possibility. We've been recovering children for over 20 years. It's just a matter of identifying the child's medical needs, understanding the child's sensory issues, and then teaching the child all of the skills they need in order to function normally. We know there's hope for autism. Autism is treatable and recovery from autism is possible. You know, I'm going to tell on myself a little bit and say, as we were watching that that clip, you know, in the beginning, there's there's pictures of my son and, and of me. And then as you go on, you see the parents who are talking. And, and I'm just going to be honest that the first time I saw that video, I, I noticed that the homes look like really nice homes. And of course... My son was uh, a client when, and, and we had gotten an email asking if we would like to have a video uh, with us talking. And of course, I always have wonderful things to say about CARD, but they wanted to do it in our home. And I just want to let you know that I felt too self-conscious about our home um, because we didn't, we, and we still don't live in a home like that. Um, so I felt really, really self-conscious about it. And if you're looking at that video and thinking, oh, well, clearly the only clients are these, you know, people who have these amazing homes. I want you to know that it, I didn't do it because I didn't want people to see, uh, my home. And I'm sure that there were other people who felt the same way. So don't get it in your head that only wealthy families can afford ABA. Cause if that were true, my kid would not have gotten ABA. Um, and, and I, I said that we were going to talk briefly when we came back about starting ABA. And I really want to say it again, that if you haven't started ABA, there is a way for you to start ABA. And if you, if you still, after everything that we said, still don't know a way that you can personally start ABA, please write me, call me, but let's like, let's talk one-on-one -on -one and let's solve it. I, I know that there are people out there who are defensive or saying, well, we just don't need ABA. I really don't know anybody who doesn't need ABA. I, I personally could benefit from ABA. So I don't know how your child on the spectrum couldn't, couldn't benefit from it. And I hope that you'll put that uh, everything else aside and say, okay, I'm going to figure out a way to make it work and I'll take some help figuring it out. Um, but when you get started on ABA, there's some things that I want you to be mindful of that it, it is not easy and that it will mess with your schedule. And it, it means letting a whole bunch of people into your home and turning the way you look at things a little bit on the side. But if we go back to Elizabeth Duget's mantra about, am I setting the child up for success? If that were the question that you woke up every morning and asked yourself, I know you would be willing to make some changes on some other things that you'll get back somewhere down the road. We've been talking about a, a lot, uh, internally, uh, here in California about convincing, uh, the governor that he needs to support ABA, that it's not for a lifetime, that it's for, you want to set yourself up for two to four years years and ask yourself if there were an emergency in your house and you had to change things for two to four years, you, you would, wouldn't you? I brought up before, if, you're, if your child had a brain tumor and you needed to be traveling to go get the treatment that was going to keep your child alive, you would find a way to do it and you would ask your neighbor and say, can you watch my other kid while I do this? You would do things because you would know that it would, was going to make the difference of your child's life. I'm telling you, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. This is the difference of who your child and, and how your child is going to be able to communicate with the world and how you're going to be able to communicate with your child and love your child and express love to your child. Don't shortchange yourself and don't change, shortchange your, your child. You know, if you have to put up a big sign on the wall that says, is this setting up my child up for success to remind you, put it there. My husband and I had what we call the manifesto and the manifesto said, we have to do everything we can for Jem, that that comes first. 
And <clears throat> when things got in the way, and there were things, can I tell you there were other things that came up that we were like, oh, it'd be nice to look at that pretty shine. No, we're working on this. This is what we're working on. And we're going to give, you know, it's, I thought of it like college. College is four years, and I thought of it like, you know, we're going to do things differently because we're going to go to autism college for the next four years, and then things are going to be different. I have to change subjects for just a second because this is how great that my son is doing. You know, we, we talked about this uh, on Thursday. Paper Clouds Apparel, this wonderful clothing company, they have contests and, and run promotions. And right now, they are selling a, a new line of the T-shirts that my son designed. Uh, that He drew this robot, and I think Emily's going to show you a picture of it. There's the, you guys asked for the girls' version. There's the girls' version with a robot on the bottom. There are men's shirts. There's kids' shirts with the robot on them. My son drew that robot, that 3D robot. And if you go on starting today, go to Paper Clouds Apparel, and if you buy the t-shirt, there are also fabulous tote bags, and there are hats. I'm a proud mama today. But uh, a portion of the proceeds goes to ACT today to give more grants to more families. So I hope that you, and can I tell you, they're the softest t-shirts you've ever felt in your life. Uh, they're made out of bamboo, and they're just wicked fabulous, like the best t-shirt that you've ever owned owned and you will be helping to support uh, kids on the spectrum with grants. So visit Paper Clouds Apparel. Emily's showing you all the different ways that you can get a hold of us here. Buy a tote bag, buy a hat, buy a t-shirt, buy a t-shirt for somebody else. Yes, it's shameless self-promotion on my child's shirts, but uh, a large portion of the proceeds go to ACT Today, Autism Care and Treatment Today for those grants that we were talking about earlier. So uh, even if, you know, if it's outside your means, and I get it. I hope you'll share it on Facebook so that other people will buy them so that there'll be more money to give so that Nancy doesn't have to say there isn't enough. She's still going to say that, but whatever. Let's make more money. Let's raise more money. Uh, tomorrow, we've got some really exciting things going on here tomorrow. We're going to have Kat Minch with us, Catherine Minch. And there's a new uh, office opening in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We're going to be talking to her about what's happening there in an open house. So if you're in Louisiana, you're not going to want to miss tomorrow. But we've got some other stuff going on, including healthy uh, eating tips. And on Wednesday, Dr. Dorian Grampache is going to be back in the house live. I know we've been running some uh, re previously recorded ones the last couple of weeks, but she's back live. So send your questions in uh, as soon as possible so that they can be on her list. And I've got some from weeks past to share with her as well. So that will be on Wednesday. We've got some really exciting things all week long. And also on Wednesday, with, when Nancy's back, we're going to be talking about Fragile X. So if you want some more information about Fragile X, that's during Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Thank you for being here with me and for keeping the conversation going. We'll be back tomorrow. Until then, please give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now.